Okay, so uh, thank you everyone and welcome to this session. I'm going to talk about one-stop talk for Kubernetes security. And who am I? I? My name is Nishant Kumar and I'm a senior software engineer at uh, Microsoft and I work for Azure Operator Distributed Services as a developer. And you can reach out to me on LinkedIn or Twitter. So talking about the agenda, uh, it was a really big challenge to put all this information uh, inside one talk, as you might all know that uh, Kubernetes security can be a conference in itself. But my main objective uh, behind putting this talk was to help all the beginners or someone who want to uh, learn about Kubernetes security but does not know where to start and what are the different areas they need to understand. So hopefully at the end of this talk, you'll have enough information to start your uh, Kubernetes journey in more depth. Uh, I'll start off by covering the overview of cloud native security, um, uh, but you'll not dive in too deep as this information is um, accessible on the uh, Kubernetes official documentation. Uh, I'll then talk about different areas like policy as code, uh, Kubernetes secrets, threat detection, et cetera, that falls under the overall scope of security. Uh, and during this talk, I'll also cover a few specific tools that are used to uh, um, that are used to address few security concerns, but that, that doesn't mean that those tools are the only uh, one for those particular use cases. Uh, the general best practice is to have a list of requirements and then explore which tool can solve your purpose. So I think let's begin. So the four C's of uh, cloud native security. Uh, when you look for Kubernetes security in the official documentation, uh, this is the first picture that show, shows up and it really sums up the scope for your uh, cloud uh, native security. Uh, so you can think about security in four different uh, layers. Uh, the four C's of cloud se native security, that is uh, your cluster or your data center, uh, the containers, uh, and, uh, clusters, containers, and code. And each of, uh, each of the layer of the security model builds upon the outermost layer. So you cannot get away by just implementing security and at one particular layer. So uh, the main takeaway from this slide is that each of these layers that you see here is equally important and you need to implement the best practices. And this talk would primarily be focused on the cluster and container uh, areas where uh, Kubernetes orchestration plays a major role. So these are some of the important things to consider in your infrastructure uh, cloud security. So all access uh, to the Kubernetes control plane uh, should not be allowed publicly on the internet and should be controlled by network access control list. And nodes uh, should be configured only to accept connections, again, by the network uh, access control list from the control plane uh, on the specific ports. And again, if possible, these nodes should not be accessible on the uh, public internet. And it is always best to provide the cluster with uh, cloud provider access that follows the principle of least privilege uh, for the resources that it needs to administer. And coming, coming to etcd, as you all might be aware, it is the data store of Kubernetes, and it, stored the, it stores the entire um, state of your Kubernetes cluster. So it's really important to limit the access uh, of, of etcd, and it should be accessible only on the control plane and uh, over TLS. And another best practice is to encrypt etcd at rest as well. Uh, and again, there are official documentation um, available on how to achieve it. Um, and then there are two areas of concern uh, for securing uh, Kubernetes. One is your uh, cluster components that are configurable, and other is the securing the applications which run in the cluster. So uh, the three most important and the basic things when securing your cluster component, uh, like the Kubernetes API scheduler and kubelet, is, uh, is API authentication, authorization, and TLS for API, tra API traffic. So talking about uh, TLS, Kubernetes expects that all API communication in the cluster is uh, encrypted by default with TLS, and most of the installation methods uh, will allow the necessary certificates uh, uh, to be created and distributed with the cluster components. And API authentication, uh, you should choose an authentication mechanism for the uh, API servers uh, to use that matches the common access patterns when you install a cluster. So for instance, a small single user cluster may wish uh, to use a simple certificate or static bearer token approach, uh, and larger clusters may wish to integrate an existing OIDC or LDAP server that allows users to be subdivided into groups. And once authenticated, every API call is also expected to pass an, pass an authorization check uh, 
Uh, so Kubernetes ships an RBAC uh, component that matches an incoming user or group um, to a set of permission bundled into roles. So as with authentication, simple and broad roles may be uh, appropriate for smaller clusters, but as more users interact with a cluster, uh, it may become necessary to separate teams into separate namespaces with more limited roles. And again, these are some of the important things to consider within uh, cluster security for application, container, and code. Um, again, this is, this is not a complete list, but these are some of the high priority items that uh, you need to consider when implementing security. Uh, for example, encrypting secret at rest or enabling port security admission, enabling the network policies, uh, running uh, tools for uh, checking container vulnerability, image signing and uh, information, uh, disallowing privileged users, uh, static code analysis, dynamic uh, probing attacks. Uh, so these are some of the high priority items that needs to be considered uh, when you're implementing security. So moving on to another section, which is uh, policy as code. And, and what is policy as code? It is uh, writing code in a high level language to manage and automate policies, which means you can store these policies in your version control system like Git. Uh, you can use these policies in audit or enforcement mode to monitor existing uh, workloads, uh, services for misconfiguration or prevent the misconfiguration uh, applying in the cluster. So if you're looking to design these policies, you should uh, broadly categorize them into uh, three categories. Uh, one is your standard policies, uh, best, practice, uh, best practices across the cluster in your organization. A few examples could be requiring uh, resources to specify the resource uh, limits or uh, limiting, uh, uh, preventing workloads from running as a root. And then organizational policies, uh, which are specific to your organization. Uh, for example, enforcing uh, private, image repository, uh, private image repository list to pull. And then uh, last, their environmental policies. Uh, so for example, your production uh, environment will require more stricter uh, policies. And some of the examples uh, while implementing policy as code is, uh, like disallowing latest image tags, uh, restricting image repositories, uh, checking for deprecated APIs, uh, and host path volumes within the pod must be uh, forbidden. So uh, pod security admission, uh, it falls under the same umbrella of uh, policy as code, and it provides us with a mechanism to secure our pods. And pod security admission is a successor to pod security policy. Uh, which was deprecated in Kubernetes in 1.21. Uh, and pod security admission uh, places requirement on pods security context uh, based on levels defined by pod security standards. Uh, and pod security standards is a, again a separate thing which defines uh, three different policies to, to broadly cover the security spectrum and these standards let you define how you want to restrict the behavior of pods in a clear consistent fashion. Uh, and these three different uh, Levels are privileged, that is purposely open and entirely unrestricted. Uh, baseline, which is aimed at uh, ease of adoption for uh, common containerized workloads uh, while preventing known privileged escalation. And restricted, which is aimed at enforcing current pod hardening best practices uh, at the expense of some uh, compatibility. And then these policies can be uh, applied in two different uh, ways either via the namespace label or the admission configuration resource. Uh, so using namespace label allows uh, for granular per namespace policy selection, whereas admin admission co configuration allows cluster level defaulting along with exemptions. So again, uh, you can go to the official uh, Kubernetes document, which has more details as to what are the different things that are allowed within each of these uh, levels, which, uh, which are found under the pod security standards. So again, here's an example uh, for enabling port security admission at the namespace level. Uh, so this manifest uh, defines a namespace, my baseline namespace, uh, and it blocks any pods that, are, uh, that don't satisfy the baseline policy requirements, uh, generates a user-facing uh, warning and adds an audit annotation to any uh, created pod that does not meet the uh, restricted po policy requirements and pins the version of the baseline and restricted policies to 1.23. And here is an example for enabling pod security admission at the cluster level. So uh, as of uh, v1.22, Kubernetes provides a, a built-in admission controller to enforce the pod security standard. 
and you can configure this admission controller to set uh, cluster-wide defaults and exemptions. So now moving on to the another area, which is policy engine. So while pod security admission that we were talking earlier uh, in Kubernetes is a set of mechanisms for ensuring validating controls for pods and their attributes, uh, but as the name would imply, it only operates on pods and nothing else, uh, and contrasts with uh, the policy engine such as uh, Gatekeeper and Caverno, uh, the capabilities are far more broad, and it's applicable to more than just the pods. So having a policy engine uh, for Kubernetes can be thought of as a way to more holistically control the Kubernetes uh, environment and not just a single domain. So OPA Gatekeeper has a constraint framework, and a constraint is a declaration uh, that is uh, uh, that, that its author wants a system to meet a given set of requirements. And each constraint is written with uh, Rego, which is a declarative query language uh, used by OPA. Uh, for example, uh, on, the, on the left side is a constraint template CRD that requires certain labels to be uh, present on an arbitrary object. And once a constraint uh, template has been deployed uh, in the cluster, an admin can uh, now uh, create individual constraint CRDs uh, as defined by the constraint template. So for example, here is a constraint CRD that requires the label HR to be present on all the namespaces. And another popular uh, policy engine tool is Caverno, uh, which is specifically, uh, specifically designed for Kubernetes that is managed as Kubernetes resource, and no new language is required uh, to write these policies. So in the earlier example, we saw a constraint template, uh, then a constraint CR with uh, a rego to be learned, which can be a bit complex. Uh, and in this case, the same policy is defined in a single file and is more Kubernetes native. So yeah, it, it really depends on the use case that you want to do. Uh, if you have more complex uh, policy requirement and you want a general policy framework, then you can use OPA. But if you're just dealing with Kubernetes resources, uh, you, it's worth trying Kiverno. And a network policy is uh, another aspect. So if you want to control traffic at the uh, IP address or port level, then you might consider using Kubernetes network policies for uh, particular applications in your cluster. Uh, and by defi default, all the connections are allowed. So each of the pod can talk to everyone if there are no network policies. And here is an example of Kubernetes network policy versus Calico. So the Kubernetes network policy API provides a standard way for users to define network policy for controlling network traffic. Uh, however, Kubernetes has no built-in uh, capability to enforce the network policy. So to enforce network policy, you need a networking solution, uh, for example, Calico. And Calico is, an, uh, is a network policy, an extension of Kubernetes network policy that has more capabilities. So on the left-hand side, you have a Kubernetes policy which uh, allows egress traffic from pods in the same namespace. And on the right-hand side is a Calico policy which provides capability to control uh, traffic to or from endpoint in a namespace. And now talking about uh, Kubernetes secrets. So the default way of uh, storing secret as base64 encoding is not secure. So we need tools to manage our secrets uh, in a more automated and secure manner. Uh, so here are some of the open source solutions like Bitnami Sealed Secrets, um, HashiCorp Vault, or External Secrets Operator and Helm Secrets, and there are a few others as well. Uh, so we need these kind of external tools to manage your secrets. But I'm going to talk about one tool which is Bitnami Sealed Secrets. Uh, and a special thing about this is that you can encrypt your secret and store it in your Git repositories along with your manifest files. So sealed secret is a one-way encrypted secret that can be created by anyone, uh, but can only be decrypted by the controller running in the target cluster. So the sealed secret is then safe to share publicly and upload to the Git repositories. And once the, once the uh, sealed secret is uploaded to your target uh, Kubernetes cluster, the controller will decrypt it and recover the original secret. So, uh, and it consists of two parts a cluster side operator or controller. So that is the one which is running inside the cluster and is used for decrypting. And a client side cube seal, uh, which is used to encrypt your uh, Kubernetes secrets. So on the right hand side, uh, you see a normal Kubernetes secret 
on the right top hand side and then you use the cube seal command line tool and then convert it into a sealed secret. So, and then it's, you can store it in your Git repositories with a manifest file. So now let's talk about the Salsa framework, uh, which is also known as the supply chain levels for uh, software architects. And it is a security framework, a checklist of standards and controls uh, to prevent tampering, improve integrity and secure packages and infrastructure in your projects, businesses or enterprises. So one of the biggest challenges for software developers is the uh, need to make informed choices about the external software and products that they are using within their own system. So evaluating whether a given uh, system is appropriately secured can be challenging, uh, especially if it's externally or third, owned by a third party. And the supply chain um, uh, has been in scrutiny over the years with attacks on the software system. So in, co in collaboration with OpenSSF, uh, Google had proposed the new Salsa framework, uh, which formalizes criteria around software supply chain integrity to help the industry and open source ecosystem uh, to secure the software development lifecycle. Uh, so it has different levels uh, up to level four, and each level deals with specific aspects uh, of security. So this is still a very new project, and I'll uh, ask you to try keeping an eye on it for future enhancements. So Six Store is uh, another project uh, which was started to improve the supply chain technology for anyone using open source uh, projects. And within Six Store, you have different sub project which focuses on specific aspects of supply chain security. So these sub-projects are uh, Cosign, Fullcio, uh, Raker, and OpenID uh, Connect. Uh, and even Kubernetes had adopted SigStore uh, in its 1.24 release. So again, a very interesting project. Uh, and keep an eye on improving and trying to improve uh, the supply chain security. So within SigStore, I'll talk about one tool, which is uh, Cosign. And it is a tool to simplify the signing and verification of the container images. So most containers available today are vulnerable to uh, supply chain attacks uh, because they can be published with nothing more than a simple API key. So if that key leaks, it's easy for an attacker to publish a legitimate looking uh, container that actually contains vulnerabilities. So one of the best ways to protect users from these kind of attack is by signing the image at creation time uh, so that developers can verify that the code they received is the code uh, that the maintainer had authored. And then you can also combine different tools to verify um, the complete flow of your container image uh, signing process. So with Cosign, uh, you can sign an image and make this uh, signature uh, available to anyone with pull access so it can be verified. Uh, then there's a project called Harbor, uh, which, uh, which can prevent images from being pulled unless they have some signature. And then you can, again, use Kiverno. Uh, to ensure at runtime that, that it is a signature that you want. So you can use these tools to automate your whole process. Now moving on to another area within the security umbrella is uh, threat detection. Uh, so far what we have covered were the preventive measures, which included proper access control, authentication, and authorization in place. Uh, but no matter what level of uh, protection a system may have, there is no uh, foolproof uh, silver bullet uh, security solution. So a defense in depth strategy uh, should be deployed. So when each layer fails, it fails to a known state and sounds an alarm. So the most uh, important element of this strategy is timely detection and uh, notification of a compromise when it happens. And thus threat detection falls under the uh, detective measures and Falco is a proje project uh, which can be used for such cases. Uh, taking a look at the Falco architecture, uh, it can detect and alert on any behavior that involves making Linux system calls. Um, Falco alerts are triggered based on specific system calls, arguments, and properties of the calling process, and it operates at the user space and kernel space. So the system calls are interpreted by uh, the Falco kernel module, and then the system calls, uh, the sys calls are then analyzed using the libraries that are present in the user, user space, uh, and the events are then filtered using a rules engine where Falco rules are configured. So suspicious events are then uh, allotted to outputs that are configured as syslog, files, standard output, and others. Some of the examples that Falco can detect is a shell running inside a, a container or a pod in Kubernetes, 
uh, and if a container is running in a privileged mode or it is uh, or an unexpected read of a sensitive file such as uh, hc shadow now talking about the kubernetes security guidance uh, frameworks uh, so since kubernetes follows a loosely uh, coupled architecture uh, securing the ecosystem involves a cross combination of uh, best practices tools and processes um, it is also recommended to consider frameworks that issue specific guidelines for easing the uh, complexity of uh, administering the security and compliance of a Kubernetes ecosystem. So to help with these various institutions offer standardized uh, frameworks and guidance for uh, administering security in a complex dynamic Kubernetes ecosystem. So these are some of the frameworks, the CIS benchmark, Mitra attack, PCI DSS, NISA framework, and the very recent NSA CI CISA Kubernetes hardening guide. And uh, these are the comparisons between the different security frameworks. Uh, and it says when we should use them. Uh, and also at the bottom, you can see, uh, you, can, you can use the tools which have been developed keeping these frameworks in mind. So if you explore these frameworks uh, closely, you would find each of them have a huge list of uh, uh, security best practice that they recommend. Uh, but it, it can be quite time consuming if you look at the complete list. Uh, but instead that you can leverage open source uh, projects, such as mentioned in the tool section, uh, which have been developed keeping these frameworks in mind. So these are some of the open source tools, um, the Kubernetes vulnerability scanning tools, and some of them have uh, been developed keeping, the mind, uh, keeping in mind the frameworks that we were talking about earlier. So, uh, so few of these tools are KubeBench, KubeHunter, KubeScape, KubeAudit, KubeScan and Crane. And I'll be talking just uh, about one tool, and, and that's KubeScape. So KubeScape uh, scans your Kubernetes cluster, your static YAML files and Helm charts, uh, detects misconfigurations uh, based on multiple frameworks such as um, NSA, CIS, and the Mitra attack that we saw earlier. Uh, it calculates risk scores and shows uh, risk trends over time, and it really has a good super friendly UI. Um, so you don't need to see the complete list of uh, the policy violations in your console, uh, and then you can move directly to the UI and see uh, what are the different violations that happen. It also has capabilities for image scanning and RBAC violations, uh, and it can also assist in remediation, and it can tell you what steps you need to take to uh, get away with those uh, policy violations. Uh, and lastly, one of the best ways uh, to develop software, uh, deploy them, and manage them in a dynamic environment is to adapt the DevSecOps model. Uh, and DevSecOps stands for Development, Security, and Operations. Uh, it's an approach which integrates uh, security as a shared responsibility throughout the entire uh, IT lifecycle. So in the past, the role of security was isolated to a, a specific team in the final stage of development. Um, but And that wasn't problematic when development cycles were lasted even months or years, but now with DevOps and agile methodologies, um, I mean, we need to take care that security is uh, taken into consideration from the start. So, it, it, so DevSecOps is, means thinking about application and infrastructure security from the start, and it also means automating some security gates to keep the uh, DevOps workflow from so slowing down. And some of the benefits are faster de delivery, uh, improved security posture, and uh, reduced cost. And finally, I think uh, uh, without these information available uh, in the internet, uh, this talk wouldn't have been possible. So thank you for all this uh, blog post, uh, which is out there. And, and yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you for coming to this talk. And um, yep, hopefully you all liked it. Thank you. <laughs>